This is the 2023 iMac, the latest desktop from Apple, and while the outside is wrapped in the same design as the previous iteration that was released two years ago, the inside of this machine is another story. For the past week, I've been digging into this iMac. There's a brand new M3 chipset in here, but there's also some things that I think are misunderstood about the iMac and some things that didn't show up in this version that I think people were hoping for. So I really wanted to understand what this machine can do and who exactly this was made for. Today, I'm going over that whole experience, what's been good, bad, and everything in between. So if you're curious at all about the 2023 iMac, maybe you're thinking of buying one or you just wanna check out where this stacks up against some of the other Macs that are out there, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. The iMac has been long overdue for an upgrade and honestly, I didn't know if we'd actually see a new one come out after the M1 version. Apple already has some pretty great desktop machines in the Mac Mini and the Mac Studio that you can pair with a studio display or your monitor of choice. And I think desktop computers as a whole have become a lot less popular since laptops have increased performance and battery life. But in my opinion, there's nothing like sitting down at a nice desktop machine. So I'm glad to see this get a refresh. This is the only desktop Mac available that you can just buy and have everything that you need in the box and then just plonk it down at your desk. And you're looking at a starting price of $12.99 for all of it, which does make this an attractive option for a lot of people, especially if you don't wanna be bothered trying to find a monitor, speakers, webcam, keyboard and mouse and so on. Inside the iMac box, you'll obviously find the Mac along with a magic keyboard and mouse that are tinted to the iMac color that you pick, as are the power and charging cables. The model that I have here is green, which is my personal favorite because it's almost more of a teal color and that combined with the white frame around the screen kind of reminds me of the first iMac that came out just with a much more modern and minimal look. The frame of the Mac and the stand are both aluminum and have a very nice metallic finish where the panel along the front is all glass looks very similar to the Apple Studio display and in general, the build quality is outstanding. That stand tilts up and down and the hinge is just the right balance of being stiff enough that it's sturdy and it's not gonna wobble around on you, but smooth enough that it's easy to change the angle without having to apply any force. It's also got an open spot for the power cable that just clips into place with a magnet. That goes into a 143 watt power adapter that also has a one gigabit ethernet port if you wanna hardwire your network connection. Speaking of ports, you've got four USB-C ports on this particular machine, two of which are Thunderbolt and the other two are USB 3.2 Gen 2, capable of 10 gigabit per second transfer speeds. The absolute base version of the iMac only comes with two USB-C ports and this is a model that's just one step up from that that sits at $1,499. I'll get into why I made the choice to pick up this version in a minute, but the last port on here is the headphone jack that sits at the bottom left-hand side of the machine. Just looking from the side, this whole thing is only 0.45 inches thick, which is kind of crazy given how much is packed in here. It's 5.8 inches deep and 18.1 inches tall and it weighs in at 9.87 pounds. So it's very light. The only thing that I'd wish they'd done, which seems to be a problem on all the new desktop Macs, is have some kind of grippy material on the bottom. The iMac just sits right on these plastic pads on the aluminum surface and it could tend to slide around on you somewhat easily. So you may want to put something rubbery underneath if you're worried about it slipping on you. Moving to the front, you have a 24 inch 4.5K retina display, which actually measures 23.5 inches. It has a 4480 by 2520 resolution with 218 pixel per inch depth density that matches the studio display, which it does resemble quite a bit in terms of the actual display quality. This only has 500 nits peak brightness where the studio display goes to 600, but it is very difficult to tell the difference between 500 and 600 side by side. It still gets very bright and looks outstanding and is probably my favorite thing about this Mac. Just like any other retina display, everything is super clear and sharp with no visible pixels. The colors look great with amazing contrast and uniformity. On IPS panels like this, you can tend to see some backlight bleed creep in or lighter black levels with the panel being backlit, but I don't get anything like that on the iMac. The colors are all very accurate and look almost identical sitting side by side with another MacBook. So any kind of color critical work like editing photos or videos or doing graphic design will look great on this display. Now this is only 24 inches and I know some people were hoping for a larger screen with the iMac this go around but I have my own theory on why there isn't a larger screen available. The Apple Studio display is 27 inches and with it being so similar, I have a feeling it'd be pretty hard to make the pricing work. If you have a 27 inch version of the base iMac that starts at 1299, it's gonna be hard to offer something affordable without cannibalizing the studio display that's 1599. That's just my opinion, but regardless, the 24 inch viewport doesn't feel too bad provided it sits within a couple of feet from you. It's fantastic for watching content and is incredibly 
satisfying to work on. Part of what makes this so enjoyable specifically for watching content is the sound that the iMac pushes out. This has a six speaker high fidelity sound system with force canceling woofers and has a surprising amount of depth and clarity for how thin this machine is. The audio fills out a room nicely whether you're watching a video or listening to music and gets quite loud without any distortion. It's not gonna be a substitute for a good set of premium bookshelf speakers or studio monitors, but for a desk setup, it's really all most people need. And again, kind of matches the studio display in that regard. The final thing that I'll mention that falls in line with the studio display is the 1080p webcam that sits on top of the iMac and the three mic array with directional beam forming. These are all about the same quality as all the other Mac products that have been released in the past couple of years. But in case you were wondering, here's a short clip just to give you an idea of what that looks like and sounds like. So this is the iMac webcam. Right now I'm talking through the internal microphones on the iMac as well. So this should give you a pretty good idea of what it looks like and what it sounds like. So up to this point, there's honestly not a whole lot that's different between the 2023 iMac and the 2021 model, which is fine considering it's all very well done. The real upgrades are when you look on the inside of the machine. As I said earlier, I have the version that's just one level up from the base model. So instead of going for the $1,299 base machine, I chose to get the version that comes in at $1,499. This has the new M3 chip with an eight core CPU and 10 core GPU, 256 gigs of storage and eight gigs of RAM. And I wanted to get this particular version for a couple of reasons. One, beyond getting the extra USB ports, I think that this configuration is one that's often underrated or misunderstood in terms of how capable it is. I frequently see people saying that these base versions are unusable and there's some confusion surrounding who these are actually for. I have the base 15 inch M2 Mac Book Air, and I've always found that to be quite competent for most things. So I'd like to try and clear that narrative up. And two, because that 15 inch MacBook Air also has an eight core CPU and 10 core GPU with eight gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD, and I've also had an M2 Air with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. This iMac performance should give me a pretty accurate baseline or context for how much things have improved and how the base configs and models above this should work as well. First of all, if all you're doing is lighter stuff like browsing the web, working with productivity or office software, or using streaming services and similar things, this is gonna be more than capable. You'll likely never feel any slowness with any of those things. And even when you get into some more creative and technical workflows, it can still manage pretty well there as well. If I'm doing just basic photo editing or graphic design, I've never felt any lag. Uh, granted, most of what I've tried has been editing smaller libraries or single photos in Lightroom and using Affinity Photo and Designer. Affinity seems to take up a lot less memory than Adobe apps. And if you're doing more resource heavy work that has a bunch of batch functions and working with tons of layers and enormous files. My guess is that it could potentially slow down on you, but for what I've needed in that context, it's been totally fine. The same goes for coding or software development. I found that if you're working on smaller projects, either learning or working on things casually where your system usage stays low, this actually feels quite snappy. In Xcode benchmarks, I saw compile times of 141 seconds on the M3 iMac versus 178 on the M2 Air, which is about a 21% increase in performance, and is only about 17% slower than the M3 Pro that came in at 121 seconds. So just in raw CPU power, it works great. I saw similar results on the GPU side of things as well. The M3 does have hardware enabled ray tracing, and when rendering out this classroom sample in Blender, I saw render times that were 12% faster than the M2, and in general, it just feels a lot smoother with anything graphics related. Simple projects in Blender and gaming are surprisingly performant. There seems to be less jankiness than on the M2, and I find it a little bit more usable, even with this only having eight gigs of RAM, which I honestly wasn't expecting with a higher resolution display. That being said, you still see memory swapping come into play heavily while gaming or for larger projects, both with Blender and software development. So if you plan to use the M3 for both of those purposes, you're likely gonna wanna bump up the RAM at the very least. I'm fine with having a base machine like this if all you're doing is picking up those tasks once in a while, or it's just more for fun or casual use. But in any kind of professional setting, having 16 or 24 gigs of RAM is gonna serve you a lot better, and that's no different with video editing. Again, this is an area where the base M3 and even the M2 is probably a little underrated. I edited my whole iPhone 15 review on the base M2 Air and it worked out fine. Granted, it does slow down with heavy effects usage and animation, but if you're just editing a simple timeline with some B-roll over top, this works just fine. The M3 iMac contains relatively the same media engine as the M2, just with the added AV1 codec, so really doesn't have any effect on video editing. 
and render times are about the same. I rendered out an 11 minute video on the M3 and the M2, and they both came in at roughly 12 and a half minutes, I believe, where the M3 Pro took just under 11. So that's largely unchanged, but if you're wondering if the iMac can be used for video editing on a regular basis, for what it's worth, I used a 13 inch M2 Air with 16 gigs of RAM to make these videos for I think about eight to 10 months or so with absolutely no issues. Obviously with video editing, you're gonna require a lot of storage, which these base machines don't have, and if you've been around on the channel for a while, you'll know that I run a lot of my apps and store everything externally through an external Thunderbolt SSD, which does save me some mileage on the internal drive and actually runs faster than the internal SSD on these base machines. Running a disk speed test, these still run at the 14 to 1500 megabyte per second read and write times that the M2 base SSDs run at. It's not terribly fast in comparison to the options above it, but in real world use, you're likely rarely ever gonna be able to tell the difference in speed versus the faster SSDs in the Pro models. I realize that 256 gigs isn't a whole lot, but for some people, everything just lives in the cloud and they just don't do a whole lot with their Max. If you're someone who is planning to do more, it probably makes sense to bump that up to at least 512, where you will see a little bump in speed as well. If you run something external like I do, you can save yourself a little bit of cash, and I like that I can use this between multiple machines as well. If you want to know more about how I use and set these drives up, I will drop a link in the description to a video going over some of the accessories and options there. While we're talking about accessories, I should also mention the keyboard and the mouse that come with the iMac. Because I opted for the version that's one step up from the base, the Magic Keyboard included comes with Touch ID, which I find really handy for unlocking my Mac and entering passwords. The keyboard is great to type on, and I have zero complaints with it outside of the fact that it charges through a lightning cable but the Magic Mouse is a different story. People seem to either love these or hate them, and I'm more in the dislike category. Tossing aside the fact that the charging port is on the bottom, I just don't find this mouse very comfortable to use. The tracking is slow, and the touch functionality is a mixed bag. It's great for gestures and scrolling, but because there's no separation between the surface where you click and the touch control, it can make things move around a bit when you're trying to click something, and it's really awkward for apps that utilize a scroll wheel as part of a toggle or a selection. Things can start inadvertently switching on you, which is less than ideal and why I prefer to use a third-party mouse, but just in regard to the keyboard and mouse working with the iMac, because they are Apple products, they're a breeze to connect and quite seamless to use, which brings us to connectivity. The 2023 iMac matches all the other newly released Apple devices with Bluetooth 5.3 and Wi-Fi 6E, which is a notable upgrade over the 2021 version with Bluetooth 5.0 and Wi-Fi 6. I generally find Wi-Fi 6E to be much faster on my home network where I get sustained speeds of over 800 megabits per second on a one gigabit fiber connection, which is generally one to 200 megabits per second faster than what I get on Wi-Fi 6. And I've had no issues with connections or drops, whether that be on Wi-Fi or Bluetooth with things like AirPods. When it comes down to it, I think the M3 iMac is a great device. Pretty much every piece of hardware here is amazing quality, the build quality is outstanding, you get an amazing 4.5k display, great sound, accessories, and it all comes in one package. The base models that Apple offers, in my opinion, aren't as limiting as some folks lead you to believe. And if you're just using this in more of a casual manner, I think these will still last a long time. I know that people say things about future-proofing your machines, but unless web browsing and checking your email somehow uses up double the processing power in the next five years, I think that most people will be okay, but you do always have the option to bump up the specs if you want to, and I just wanna let everyone know that they do have options, and I hope this provided you with some value in that regard. If it did, or if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give it a thumbs up, and if you wanna see more tech-related content or help me create an AI that gives people terrible fashion advice, please subscribe. That is it for me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next upload.